As I stood sipping a cup of green tea in the middle of the night, sitting on my porch and looking into the swamp beyond my house, sickly lights began to dance and flash in front of my eyes. I remembered my grandmother's warning about the corpse lights. Teddy? She said to me, sitting on the same porch twenty years earlier, smoking a cigarette and drinking a glass of wine. Do you see those lights? The ones that stay close to the ground, change colors and disappear or reappear constantly. My small, five-year-old self nodded. Yes, Grammy, I said. They're pretty. She nodded at this, taking another long drag off of her cigarette. Yes, they sure are. She said gravely. They're also dangerous. You should never go into the woods at night, but especially when those lights are there. Where I'm from, we call them corpse lights. It means the Fae are nearby. They like to hide behind the lights. I nodded quietly at this. She had told me about the Fae, how they sometimes kidnapped children and took them to their underground lairs, never to be seen again. She didn't tell me what the Fae did to those children or why they wanted children at all. She simply said they were not to be trusted and that I should always avoid areas where they frequent, especially at nighttime. There are lots of Fae hunting grounds near here, she said to me. It has been that way since before the Europeans settled this land centuries ago. The Native Americans used to consider that swamp sacred ground. But now I was an adult, and moreover, I was curious. I had looked up the scientific explanations for these lights that appear and disappear in flashes all over the forest and swamp showing up in blue, green, red, or white flashes that shimmered and vibrated. Supposedly, it had something to do with the decomposition of plant matter and the resulting gases that appeared. People had been seeing them for thousands of years, calling them by many names. As I sat there, thinking about Grammy Greylock, who had died just a few years earlier, the old-style TV on the porch changed from some sitcom with too much fake laughter into the nightly news. A pretty young reporter sat at a desk, staring into the camera. And we start with some breaking news. The latest victim of the Westland Ripper was found today. Police say a woman in her early 30s was found by her father, sexually assaulted and tortured to death, who later told the police he hadn't heard from her in a week. This latest murder brings the known number of victims up to 12. With us, we have Special Agent Ellis of the FBI. What can you tell us about this serial killer in the investigation? The nondescript agent appeared on the screen, speaking deadpan into the camera. Well, unlike most known serial killers, this suspect targets both males and females. He is an equal opportunity killer, and he is extremely organized planning his crimes in meticulous detail before I shut the TV off, rising and stretching out my arms and back. The news was always so depressing, and the latest crime had happened only a 20-minute drive from where I live, which made it even worse. My attention returned to those floating lights behind my house. I got up out of my chair, chugging the last of my green tea quickly, and went inside to grab a flashlight. Without a second thought, I walked out towards the trail that wound its way through the swamp and deep into the forest. At first, it was just a beautiful night hike. The stars were bright overhead as there was no light pollution for miles in any direction. The moon looked nearly full and my light caught many bats flashing through the trees, hunting bugs and squeaking in their eerie way. Then I heard something that didn't sound like any animal I had ever heard. It was a deafening screaming noise, but it wasn't a fox or a fisher cat. I knew the cries of both of those animals, having heard them frequently living out here in the country. This was the sound like a woman overcome by the deepest grief. Like the wail of a mother who just lost her only child. 
Hello? I called out into the darkness. The corpse lights began to drift towards me, floating a few inches off of the ground and shimmering with colors. I stopped, an eerie creepy feeling coming over me. I immediately turned around and tried to walk back home as fast as I could, but within a few feet of walking, the corpse lights started to cover the trail. Smaller ones seeming to congeal into larger bubbles of flashing light. I saw flashes within, as if tiny bolts of lightning were flicking across the clouds. Hesitating, taking a deep breath in, I put my right hand into the corpse light, the white shimmering seeming to lessen for a moment as I touched its surface. And then, I could see every vein, artery, and capillary in my entire hand. Shrieking, I pulled it back out, looking down, my skin was back and my hands seemed totally fine, but my heart was still beating fast and I felt eyes all over me. What the hell was that? I whispered to myself, regretting ever stepping foot in the woods. I stared deeper into the corpse light and realized the surface looked like it was zooming into itself, as if it were a fractal image. I saw the same sparks of lightning arranged in the same way over and over as it moved faster. The white light on the outside shimmering as it moved towards the center. And then, a naked sickly woman stepped out of it, breaking my hypnosis instantly. At least I thought it was a woman, until I looked at her face. Her face was melting off, like candle wax. It deformed. Beads of skin dripping off her nose and chin constantly, but it constantly reformed itself again. Her eyes would be covered by the constantly shifting skin and muscle, but then reappear again, shining silver in the moonlight. The body of the thing was thin and emaciated, looking like a cancer patient in the last days of life. I could see every single rib, and her hip bones stuck out over legs that looked like twigs. But her hair was somehow the most disturbing part. It was stringy, black and clotted together with what looked like blood. Drips of black fluid and dozens of writhing maggots constantly fell off the ends of each clump of hair which was so long it nearly reached to her knees, being the only covering on her diseased looking body. Time seemed to slow down and in a moment I flashed back to a conversation I had had with my grandmother. Never run from a fae, she said as we sat on the back porch in the afternoon sunlight. They will tear you apart. When I was a little girl, my grandmother told me the same thing and it saved my life. I accidentally stumbled into one as a teenager. I tried to think of her as a teenager, but my mind failed completely. I had always known her as a sweet old woman. And like my grandmother told me, you grab it, hug it as tight as you can, and it will hug you back. I giggled at this, thinking of hugging a fairy. She smiled down at me. It's not like a real hug, though, she continued. It's like you're hugging it with your mind, and its mind hugs you back. And it will take you someplace else, and if you keep hugging it long enough, it will be under your power. The Fae cannot lie. You can even tell it to come to you if you ever need it, though I don't recommend it. When it comes, it won't be under your power any longer. It will be free and it will be angrier and stronger than ever. Why can't they lie, Grammy? I asked, snuggling closer to her on the bench, feeling her warm, comforting presence next to me. She shrugged. They worship the truth, live in the truth, she said. It's like their religion. They don't worship God, but they worship power, life, and death, and sometimes evil. All those things spring from the truth. They have existed since the beginning of time. 
The Fae cannot think except through that which has always existed, so it limits them and their minds. I shuddered, my five-year-old mind trying to comprehend it and failing. I just hoped I would never run into one. Trembling, a sickly sweet smell started to pop out all over my body as my adrenaline soared. I ran forward, arms out. I grabbed the thing across the chest, but part of me knew I was not grabbing it with my physical body at all. It was more like my mind wrapped around its heart. Its mouth widened into an O that took over most of its melting face. Its silver eyes widened, and then I was out of my body completely. We were descending through the ground together. I smelled the grass and leaves as we rushed through them like ghosts, and then we entered the dirt underneath. The corpse lights had expanded to become the entire world around us as we sped faster, forever going straight downwards. It felt as if I were descending through some gas giant, Jupiter or Saturn maybe. Multicolored thick gases swirled all around us, huge lightning bolts sending white light shooting out in all directions yet making no sound. The melting face of the woman grinned up at me, lengthening fangs showing underneath the waxing dripping of her skin. I smiled back, even though inside I was terrified, and even thought I might die of a heart attack if this went on too long. I tightened my mind around her, seeing it like a rope twisting around her bony, naked chest and saw her grin turn into a grimace. She did the same back at me, and I felt my chest tightening, a suffocating feeling overtaking me. I couldn't breathe, but the more anxiety and fear I felt, the more I kept tightening my consciousness around her body. Stop that! She said in my mind, speaking telepathically instead of physically. Her real mouth now opened into a silent scream. You're hurting me! You're killing me! Release me now! No! I grunted through the suffocating tightness. Not until you give up. Release me now or I will drop you down here. She responded, now yelling in my mind, sending all other thoughts scattering like scared fish in a pond. The corpse lights had begun to clear, and we were in some horrific landscape deep under the earth. All around us massive leeches crawled, ten feet long. Tortured beings of all kinds tried to run, but their tormentors were too fast. Some had massive holes on their chests and backs and faces, clotted gore running out, but they healed again and a new swarm of leeches slithered over and lunged at them in turn. Out of the ponds and lakes all around us, black water hid eldritch monstrosities underneath. But tentacles flew out any time anyone ran too close to the water, fanged suckers ripping through the victim's flesh, dragging them upside down and plunging them into the water. The echoing of the screams and the splashing of the water resounded back and forth across the light brown stones of the caverns, soft light spilling out of the rocks themselves. I saw other fae like the woman standing here and there, some of them sleeping in small nooks dug out of the cave walls. Others helping to torment the beings and laughing about it as they did so. You cannot. I said through gritted teeth. She could not drop me unless I let go first. I felt her will beginning to give. I'm dying. Her voice screamed in my mind. You're killing me. Then give up. I whispered, though I also felt close to death. My vision was beginning to turn black, my head bursting with pain. I release you. Her voice said and the pain was gone instantly. I kept hold of her for a few more seconds. Do you promise to do what I ask if I let go? I said. Yes. Her voice said in my head and I released her. Floating, I fell back a few inches, taking in deep, sweet breaths, my vision returning to normal, my heart no longer feeling so tight it felt like a fist was closing over it. First, what is your name? I gasped. My name is Lilin. 
she said to me, her face melting faster, her eyes blazing with hatred and fury. Out of nowhere, an idea came to me, a dangerous one, but my instincts told me to go with it. Okay, Lilin, mine is Teddy. When I say, come to me now, Lilin, in the future, you will come. She nodded, her eyes seeming to smile now, the look of hatred receding from her face. Yes, when you say, come to me now, Lilin, I will come. Her voice sounded so spiteful and full of hate that I flinched slightly when she sent this message out. Now bring me back up! I said, feeling relieved to have survived and not gotten stuck in this underground hell on Earth. I drew close to her again, wrapping my mind around hers, seeing my mind's projection of arms wrap around her strange, sickly body, and within moments, we were back in the dark woods. I was standing in my body at the same spot that I had been when I first saw her, hyperventilating as I swayed unsteadily on my feet. Get out of these woods, she whispered in a low, demonic voice, and the next time I see you, I will kill you. I walked out of there, pouring myself a huge glass of whiskey when I got home, but I still didn't sleep that night. I was afraid of what I would see if I did. My hands were trembling so badly that when I poured myself the fourth glass of whiskey around dawn, I dropped the entire bottle, seeing it shatter all over the porch. A few weeks had passed, and I was beginning to wonder if I had imagined the entire thing, maybe while sleepwalking or during some strange, isolated seizure event. After all, every day that passed made the encounter seem more and more like a dream. The night I saw Lillian again, I had just gotten home from work. I felt exhausted. It was Friday, and I wanted to lay down and catch up on my sleep. I fell down heavily on the bed, and I was out almost instantly. My dream was bizarre. I kept seeing that fey woman from the forest, her face dripping off the bones. When all the flesh was gone and puddled on the floor at her feet, she smiled at me, just a skull, and pointed up at the sky. I looked up and saw a symbol I had never seen before. It looked like a backward silver-colored seven with a diagonal slash through it, surrounded by a glowing white circle. Soon, I will be free. She said to me, her skull chattering out of sync with the words, yet her voice still coming through loudly and clearly. That symbol will guarantee it, and I will never stop hunting you until we are even. A crash brought me back to waking life. I sat up in my bed looking at the alarm clock. 11.47 AM. I heard footsteps crunching on broken glass in the kitchen. A few seconds later, a man with an executioner's hood over his head walked calmly into my bedroom. On his forehead, he had painted the same symbol I had seen in my dream. The backward seven with the circle around it. In his hand, he had an old-looking revolver which he pointed directly at my face. Freeze, maggot. He said, a tone of mirth in his voice. Who are you? What do you want? I asked, now wide awake and frozen in terror. Well, the news calls me the Westland Ripper. <laughs> He said, giggling an insane high-pitched laugh. I guess that's as good as name as any. Get the fuck out of my house. I said coldly. He pulled the gun back, pistol whipping me across the jaw. I felt something in it give, my mouth filling with the warm taste of blood. I spit out a tooth. Why, what are you going to do about it? Now, you're going to be a good boy. He said his voice now as emotionless as a robot's. I'm going to tie you up, unless you want me to shoot your dick off first. Try anything and that will be the result. He pointed the gun at my crotch to emphasize his point, and then proceeded to pull out a coil of thick rope from his back pocket. Though I rarely watch TV, 
Even I had heard about the Westland Ripper. He had injected corrosive acids into the flesh of some of his victims, burned others alive, and the FBI allegedly believed he had killed dozens of people above and beyond his official body count. Not only was he a serial killer, but an extremely sadistic torturer. I knew if he got me tied up, that would be the end of me. I did the only thing I could think of. Come to me now, Lillian! I screamed, my broken, swelling jaw muffling my words slightly. I spit out small droplets of blood as I yelled. The killer raised his gun to pistol whip me across the face again, but he never got the chance to bring it down. The entire room filled with the corpse lights in an instant. Flashes of light shone on the insane, melting face of Lillian as she materialized behind the intruder, grabbing his gun arm and forcing it up higher with her bony, claw-like fingers. In a flash, her mouth opened wide and she bit into his armpit. Shaking her head from side to side like a rabid dog, she ripped off a huge chunk of skin and muscle. He was screaming now, blood pouring down his all-black outfit. As she ate him alive, I got out of bed, sprinting out to my car. The screams of the man followed me, growing more and more desperate. When I reached the threshold of the front door, Lillian's voice echoed in my mind. Where are you going, friend? She asked in a mirthful voice. I'm not done with you yet. You can run, but you can't hide. I pulled out my phone to call 911 and reported the armed intruder, driving out of that town well above the speed limit. The police only found a mess of gore in my bedroom when they arrived, an eyeball in one corner, a finger under the bed and so on. Most of the body was just gone. I never returned to that town. I sold my grandmother's house that I had inherited, using the money to leave the state entirely. But I don't think that will keep me safe. Lillian isn't gone. Despite moving 300 miles away, I just looked out the window. Under the streetlight outside, I saw the silhouette of a naked, emaciated woman with long, black hair.